So today, I'm going to continue down the World Barista Championship score sheet. Uh, and on this, on this video, I'll be talking about the milk drink course. Um, now, there is not a lot of scoring elements in here, but there is a lot to talk about because this category has changed a lot. Uh, it's very different than it used to be. So let's get right into it. First of all, let's take a look at the score sheet. If you take a look at the score sheet here, you'll see that there are three score elements in the milk drink section. There is one impression score, which is the visual appeal. There is one experience score, which is the taste experience. And there is one accuracy score, which is the accuracy of taste descriptors. All in all, that equates to 33 points on the score sheet per judge, um, so which is the actually the lowest scoring category of the competition. Now, before I go any further, I think it's a good idea to really read through the definitions of milk drinks because this is this category has had some really big changes recently. So let's look at pages 10 through 11, section 3.2. Uh, I'm going to read actually some of these bullet points verbatim uh, and paraphrase a couple others, but here we go. Uh, milk beverage is a combination of one shot of espresso per the definition of espresso that we talked about in the previous video uh, and steam milk with WBC provided espresso machine, which should produce harmonious balance of rich, sweet milk and espresso. Um, it's, a, it's a bit of a fluffy way to say it better tastes like coffee and it better tastes really, really good. The second bullet point is all commercially available unflavored milks can be used. Plain, sweetened or unsweetened plant-based milks and animal milks can be used. There is a note that no human milk will be accepted or a competitor will zero, receive zero in this category. Um, it's interesting that they include that, um, but it also does not exclude any other type of animal milk, which is fascinating as well. Now, more uh, fun uh, updates, right? Combining and blending commercially available milks is allowed, providing all milks are commercially available and prepared as directed. If required, commercially available milk powders may be used if, if prepared as directed on the package. Outside of combining milks, no additions may be made to the milk. You can't add something to the milk, regardless of the type of milk chosen. Competitors can remove elements of the milk from commercially available milks. This is a big example being freeze distillation, right? Provided that no ingredients or additives are used in the process of distillation. Uh, so this has come up because of, like I say, freeze, distill, freeze distilled milk in particular. Uh, where the, the, the whole jug of milk is frozen, it's then turned upside down, set at room temperature or in a refrigerator, ideally, um, to allow the solids, all the sugars and fats and all the proteins and everything else comes out. Because the proteins and fats and sugars melt at a rate that's just faster than the water ice, you get a nice concentration. There's a huge concentration of all the components that are in that milk, while basically removing the water from it. Um, it's become very, very popular, very commonplace. There are other methods as well to, to do this. Um, now, this bullet point in particular, letter C uh, on this definition, uh, gets a little interesting because it says you can use milk powder, but it has to be prepared as directed on the package. Uh, moving on to the next one, Milk beverages must be served with latte art, central circle of, um, with a central circle of white milk. Latte art expression can be any pattern you want. Milk beverages must be served in a vessel that's easy to, that you can drink from, no functional detriment. Um, that's a, that's a definitely a holdover. It's just kind of saying don't put this in something that you can't hold properly or whatever else. Um, this also may include if the cup is too hot, right? Um, no ing additional ingredients or toppings may be used, uh, including but not li limited to sugar, spices, powdered flavorings. Um, that's that's a really old school rule that, that came from like 2001 rules and regulations. You can't put cocoa powder on top. You can't put chocolate powder, whatever, on top of it. Um, milk beverages must be served to judges with a napkin and unflavored water. Uh, otherwise, you'll get a lower score in attention to detail. This is also a very old rule, um, but still, you know, you should have a napkin and water, I guess. Um, nothing other than ground coffee and water may be used to make the coffee that you're putting in there. Um, that's basically the, what the definitions of the milk drinks are. I think the most interesting ones are the, probably the first three. Those are the ones that have sort of changed the most uh, recently. Um, but to go beyond that, now, we've, we've talked, you know, 
Um, we've talked about the definition now of what a milk drink is, but now, now let's talk about what the rules and regulations are saying for the evaluation of the milk drink. All right? Now, there are a couple of things before I get to the actual scoring elements. There is a standard protocol uh, on, on tasting drinks. You look at, the, look at the milk drink, you judge the latte art, you take two sips from the crema ring on the outside, which should be there, uh, from different spots on the cup. Uh, so this is the basic protocol of drinking the drink. Competitors can change that protocol if they wish, although they need to be very clear with what their intention is and, and how to do what they do. A lot of people are telling judges to stir the drink, um, integrate the crema and the foam together, things like that. Um, so you can change your protocol if you'd like to, but once again, make sure it's very clear. Now, let's go to the first scored element, the visual appeal. The visual appeal is, um, I think, one that a lot of people focus on, but it's actually a really pretty straightforward scoring element. So let me read the rule real quick. Judges will evaluate the appearance of the milk beverage to determine its visual score. On the surface, the milk beverage should have a color combination of milk and coffee. It should have a good color contrast definition. Balance in the cup, meaning like is it placed in the center? Does it fill the cup well? Symmetrical design and a smooth and possibly, possibly glossy glass-like sheen, right? Now you'll notice that there is nothing saying that it needs to be, there's a level of difficulty, right? It, needs, it doesn't need to be a complex pattern. It doesn't say that. Uh, it also says it's not acceptable for milk beverages to be topped with spices or powders. We already talked about that, right? Um, so that's the rule, right? Pretty straightforward, pretty simple. The scoring is zero to three. So this is the um, impression score, and it's it's not it's not a multiplier either. So it's literally just one, two, three, no half points, and it is just it, was it really good? Was it okay or sort of good? Was it not very good at all? Um, there's not quite as much of a clear delineation of what defines a one on this category, um, but basically to say if there is some level of contrast or a white spot and a brown spot, um, you're probably getting a one. Uh, I think unacceptable being zero is essentially there is no concept of latte art period on there. So in the judge's interpretation, what you're looking at is you're looking at those basically five specific uh, scoring elements, right? Color contrast, combination of milk and coffee, balance in the cup, symmetry, glossy sheen, right? So you can make a dot in the middle of the cup and it fills up well, it looks really good. That could potentially score a three. Um, there is a little bit of interpretation from the judges that can come into this, but ultimately they're looking for that. So in my opinion, you make a really just well-defined heart in the cup, fills the cup well, centered, um, nicely symmetrical, both you don't have like a wonky side on the heart, things like that. That's, that is capable of getting a three in this category. Um, <clears throat> now, that's all you really need to do. You do need to make sure you have an unbroken crema ring, essentially, and with that contrast, you don't wanna have any washouts, like saying have lighter tan spots in the darker brown crema, things like that. Those are things that could potentially pull you down to a two on this. But let's talk about the weighting of this. So this score, in particular is worth 1.8% of the total score sheet, right? Not a lot. It's really worth three points total from each judge. There's no multiplier, which means that, you, you know, if, if you lose a point, you lose that one point. Um, you don't have a massive impact to your total score. Uh, so honestly, it's make it really solid. Don't overthink it and just, you know, do it as simply as you can, as well as you can, I would say is the best advice um, for the judges as well. You know, it's, it's like, if don't, don't hyper scrutinize it, right? I've had, I've had people say like, oh, well, you know, it's only a heart. It's not a, it's not a tulip. It's not a whatever. It's like, that's, there's no requirement for that. That's not in the rules. So don't start, start talking about that. Um, and also, you know, you'll start to say like, oh, you know, there's a little bit of fuzziness on the head, this one edge, you know, and I'll sit there and say like, okay, everything else looked excellent. And there's one little tiny little nitpicky thing. You're paying a lot of attention to that. That's the idea of making this a zero to zero to three score. Is that 
Don't nitpick it. And does it look great? Is it well done? Does it represent those sort of five criteria? Criteria. If it does, that's a three, right? So that's that's pretty well taken care of. I think it's pretty straightforward as well, and it's not really worth that many points at the end of the day. Granted, you don't want to lose points, but there are more important things to be thinking about as well. So let's move to the second scoring criteria, which is the accuracy of taste descriptors. Now, let me read the rule here real quick. It's not very long, but it is very similar to the accuracy of taste descriptors in the espresso course that we had in the previous video. Judges will listen to the taste, flavor, and aftertaste descriptions and explanations given by the competitor and compare those with the beverages served, or the beverage served in this case. This score is based on how accurately those descriptors match the taste experience of the milk beverage. Taste descriptors must be given or a score of zero will be received in this category, right? So if you just say anything that is a flavor and that's a one, right? Automatic one. That's, that's, that is the rule. Um, beyond that, now there's a little bit, once again, there's always a little bit of interpretation. Um, you do want to make sure that you cover the bases that you're being accurate in terms of you know, what is actually being tasted in the cup. And once again, the judge's interpretation is always going to determine how this goes, but I, and the idea, once again, is not to be overly scrutinizing, to say, are you in the right range? Are we tasting the same types of things? As opposed to, no, no, you said, you know, ripe cherries and I tasted stewed cherries. I'm just like, okay, we're both tasting cherries. So let's let's get on with that conversation. Right. Also, the uh, accuracy of taste descriptors is the same as it is in the in the espresso course. So it is zero to three, but it's times four points. And I can have my disagreements in terms of that being the case, but that is what it is. So every point that you lose or you don't get or the, that a judge does not score affects four points on your score sheet. And for every judge, it affects four points. So it's a total possible of 16 points difference if everybody didn't quite taste it right and gave you a two versus everybody said, yeah, I pretty much taste that and they give you a three. Um, so this one point for point is, again, the, the heaviest hitter. Uh, and you want to make sure that you maximize the three on this as, as much as possible. So that's taken care of. Let's talk about the taste experience. Here's where things get a little bit, little bit difficult to interpret, especially compared to the espresso. Um, but we'll read the rule first here. For the taste experience, the milk beverage is a beverage consisting of one espresso and steamed milk. We know that served at a temperature that is immediately consumable. So make sure it's not too hot. Uh, and too cold is another discussion. The texture and temperature of the beverage and the taste of the coffee and milk will be included in the taste experience evaluation. The milk beverage should, should have a harmonious balance of the sweetness of the milk and its espresso base. The taste profile, flavor and aftertaste of the beverage served should support specialty coffee with a balance created by the addition of milk. Now, once again, we have that wording that is should support specialty coffee. Very nebulous. And if you're using an alternative milk, what does that mean, right? Does it taste like oats? Does it taste like coconut? Does it taste like almonds? Does that support specialty coffee? Surely it should have, it should be allowed to use any of those if those are what you choose. Um, but let's go back to the, the very basic idea of the milk drink, right? First of all, it should be harmonious, right? We should be able to taste those flavors integrated. They should work really well together. One of the reasons we've always used dairy milk is because dairy milk just typically pairs very well with roasted coffee. Uh, you now with the addition of alternative milks and other animal-based milks, uh, you know, you can have some pretty big flavor impacts on there. So it's your job, I think, to not just use a milk because you want to or because it's making a statement or something like that. Uh, you need to make something that does still taste very good, right? So if you have a very, very strongly tasting goat's milk, uh, that is very likely to overpower some of the flavor characteristic of the coffee. So you do still need to take that in, into consideration. The same with plant-based milks, right? If you use 100% coconut milk, chances are it's going to taste a lot more like coconut than it is like coffee. And so there is a little bit of saying like, does that really support specialty coffee flavors? Maybe not, but it's not harmonious, 
right? It's not the harmony of the milk and the coffee together to create this beautiful experience. Um, texture and temperature are also a part of this, right? So if you serve something that's really cold, uh, it usually doesn't get as good of scores because it's not pleasant to get something that's almost tepid. Uh, we are usually expecting it to be a hot drink. Interestingly enough, I don't see anything that says that the drink has to be hot, which is fascinating to think at the very least. Um, but general consensus is that it's a hot drink that's steamed on the on the espresso machine. So if you serve something that's sort of like, uh, you know, just slightly cool and not very hot, not very warm, then it does tend to have a bit of a negative impact. Uh, now the texture thing is something I really want to talk about. We talk about creaminess. We talk about that. There is there is creaminess in the sense of fats. There's creaminess in the sense of the milk foam and then the thickness that it's created with the, with the air that's in it. Um, the way that we're making milks nowadays, and I will talk a lot more about this in, in another section here, is there's a lot of freeze distilled milks. There's a lot of stuff that's very concentrated milks. And this is bringing a lot of body and texture just naturally from the milk. So you're sort of saying, hey, if I just throw essentially melted ice cream in here with this coffee, it's going to taste great. And look, if it does, that is allowed in the rules and you should do it, you know, if, if it's a really great experience. I, I look at this drink, uh, especially when you're talking about the taste experience. It, usually it's a little sweet, usually it's very creamy and heavy, and usually it has a good distinction of the flavor of the coffee in it. And if you nail those three things, then you can get very good scores on the milk drink. Uh, in the taste experience in particular. So don't be afraid to experiment, don't be afraid to do a bit. You can go too far with concentration of milk and fattiness in particular becomes quite unpleasant and some people are very very um, particular and a little sensitive to that as well. Lastly, let's talk about the weighting of this. So just like in the milk drink, there is one and it's usually the taste experience that is the highest weight. Right, so 10.8% of your score, your total score, is the taste experience. This is the one you wanna make sure and maximize. You wanna make sure you get as many points as you can in it, but if you miss half points, it has a far less of an impact on your final score, okay? So, you know, if you say, hey, you know, I'm, I should be hitting a five on this, on this taste experience, which is, a, should be a really good drink at that point. If you don't quite nail it, but you still get your flavor notes and you've lost a half point, that means that you've lost a point and a half in total from each judge as opposed to missing the, ta the taste description, which is four points per judge. So if you're going to lose you know, a half point somewhere on the taste experience, you're better losing that than losing a whole point on your taste description because that's the deviation being 1.5 for the taste experience. Granted, you don't want to lose any points anywhere, but if you have to lose something somewhere, you're better to lose a half point here than on your taste description. So let's overview the total category weighting here, recap some of the most important boxes. Like I say, milk drink is very straightforward. There's only three categories. Visual appeal, not that important. Just make it solid, just make it good. Even if you only get a two, you're still in a perfectly fine place. And now it also shouldn't be that hard for you to get a three. Practice, make sure that you have an unbroken crema ring on the, on the top of the, the, the milk drink. Uh, make sure that you have your symmetry right. Make sure that you have your balance in the cup uh, and try your absolute best to get it glossy and shiny. And you should be able to get a three. Like it shouldn't be that hard. Um, taste experience being the most, ex most heavily weighted. Um, just, just simply that. Make sure it's an excellent, delicious, creamy, sweet, good temperature milk drink that you just can just drink it all day long. And then lastly, obviously, your accuracy of taste description is more about getting the full points and not losing a point, not losing one of the points because that just has massive implications in terms of the math. So obviously this isn't going to tell you how to get the highest score on your taste experience, but 
I think if we talk a little bit about alternative milks and the new rules that are going around what milks you can use, it might help this a little bit. Uh, and we also haven't talked about the size of the drink too, because the size of the drink, and I'll cover that really quickly here first, the size of the drink has changed recently. It used to be that it needed to be a very specific range. I believe it was 150 to 180 mils or somewhere around there, 210 mils of, of a cappuccino, as we would call it, uh, with one shot of espresso and the rest being milk. Now they've changed the rules several years ago now to say, hey, you can use whatever size drink you want to. You can use a bigger cup and underfill it if you like. You don't have to do any of those things. It needs to be fit for purpose, but it needs to create a very tasty, harmonious, coffee-focused milk drink. Um, so what you can do with that is you can look at, hey, how big of a drink do I have? If I'm putting in my milk, and it's overpowering the, the coffee, then maybe I need a smaller cup or I maybe need to use less milk and I just need to, to have a better balance there where the coffee can shine through. Sometimes that doesn't work though because what ends up happening is you just lower the amount of milk and it concentrates the coffee, but then the coffee flavors you realize aren't really harmonizing with that milk. That's not really working together. So in that case, you need to find a different milk, you need to, to figure out a different technique that changes the flavor profile of the milk, or change a different coffee, do something different with your coffee through extraction or selection to or through roast to make it pair better as well. Now, we've, we've talked about everything else. Let's talk alternative milks and milk options, okay? Because there's a lot to think about there. First of all, what is an alternative milk? An alternative milk is, you know, you're thinking, oh, I just have oat milk. I have almond milk. I have a, I have a usually a Tetra Pak container of something that I can open up, shake it up, and use it as a substitute for milk. That's generally what the the, the spirit I think has been for for alternative milks. But the rules and regulations don't really say too much about what makes an alternative milk. If you you know are making a any type of milk, you can be making a milk from sunflower seeds. You can be making milk from uh, you know some strange nut that you've found in the rainforests of the, of the Amazon. And, and it, as long as it is commercially available, which is another discussion we'll have here in a second, um, then you can use it, right? It, it, you can also, there's also saying that you can, it can be sweetened, right? Because alternative milks usually have some sugar addition to balance them properly. Um, they also have oils added to them. They also have other stabilizers, other things like that. Sometimes they have a lot of things. Sometimes they'll have, you know, aquafaba, and then they'll have uh, a nut, and then they'll have oat milk, oat, oat powder, and they'll have all these other things all combined together to make a milk beverage that's not made from dairy milk. Um, so in that sense, what is an alternative milk? It can pretty much be anything, as long as it's not flavored, but that is a little ambiguous as well. So. I, I think the idea is this, like, hey, it's not vanilla flavored, or it's not blueberry flavored milk, right? There's not something that's specifically making it taste like something other than its primary constituent. If you use almond milk, almonds have a flavor, and they taste like almonds. So, in theory, we should be tasting almonds when we get the milk. Um, in my opinion, you could probably figure out a way to make anything that is combined and works for your purpose and make it fit into the rules and regulations as they sit right now. So, you know, there's room for experimentation. Could be pretty interesting. There's a lot of people who have combined dairy milk and non-dairy milks together to get good results. Um, we've had people do using small percentages of coconut milk, say 10-15 percent. We've had people use small percentages of oat milk 15, 20 percent, something like that. Um, you've had people using all kinds of other things as well. Uh, then the last bit of that is also other animal milks are, are available. I think most of them have a pretty strong flavor. Uh, and I don't know that any of them is terribly superior to using cow's milk, just a good quality cow's milk if you want to use an animal milk. But like I say, the, the world's your oyster if you want to experiment with it. Now, that does bring up one question, which is, what is commercially available? Commercially available was put into the rules for a very specific reason. And I asked about this, the World Barista Championship judges calibration last year. I said, what, what makes something commercially available, right? What is it that determines that it is commercially available? 
Um, the intention behind it seems to be that it needs to be packaged in a way that's food safe and ready to sell. It could be you could sell it to anybody. The the idea being that it's safe, right? There's no risk to the judges to to drink it and. I would argue that we already have that risk by freeze distilling milk and leaving it at room temperature for too long as well. But, different story. <laughs> um, to make something commercially available, can you make it, commercially package it, put it into packaging and seal it properly, sell it in your cafe, and you know, they basically prove that it is commercially available? Is that commercially available? It, it kind of seems like it, as long as it's food safe. So once again, you can do some things to get what you need out of this drink. And in my opinion, it sort of makes it into a secondary signature drink, essentially, right? Because there are a number of ingredients that can be added. There are a number of things that can be manipulated into a milk. And it usually comes across as some sweet, decadent dessert in general, right? Uh, so. I want to say, I haven't seen as much experimentation with this as I would have expected from the rules changes, but we'll see what happens at the coming WBC as well. So that's the rundown of the milk drink section of the WBC score sheet. It, you know, it's definitely changed over the years, and I don't really think that it very well represents the real world of milk drink preparation anymore in, in terms of what cafes do, unless they're a place that's specializing in, you know, competition style experiences and things like that. Um, but it does serve a purpose, I suppose, in the sense of showing what can we do? Like what can we do to, to rethink and reimagine what a milk drink is or you know things like that. So there is a, there is a reason why I think it, it, can, it works and I think it has, it has value. It just is not going to represent what most people are doing in a cafe these days. That's it for today. Uh, next time I'll be looking at the signature drink section, and then beyond that I'll be looking at the barista evaluation portion of the score sheet. Uh, so please uh, follow, share, like, subscribe, whatever it is people do, and uh, I will talk to you next time. <laughs>